I'd like to now call the October board meeting of the Central School District together. Uh, I welcome you to the Central School District board meeting. Comments from the community are entertained during the time designated under communications public comments. If you wish to speak to the board, please fill out a comment card and turn it into the board secretary or the board chair at the beginning of the meeting. These were out in the hall and I think there's probably some on the table over there by Mr. Gorman. Speaker's comments in this forum are limited to three minutes, but the board welcomes additional information in writing. Personnel laws prohibit the board from hearing public comments about an individual in an open meeting. All complaints must go through the board's approved process as outlined in board policy KL. This form may be found on our website or by calling the district office. Typically, a speaker's comment is taken under advisement to allow time for the board to review an issue. However, the board chair or other board members may ask a speaker for additional information or may convey to the speaker some information that addresses their concern. Please note on the speaker card if you would like to receive follow-up and communication and if so, what avenue is preferred. Thank you again for your attendance at this meeting in the Central School Board. So at this time, Superintendent Cabisto will present the agenda and any changes. Yes, we are going to make one uh, change. We are going to move up uh, item 5 to b the Central Education Association representatives because we have students uh, from Talmud that are here to present. So we're going to adjust that. So in the uh, as you look at your agenda, we will go uh, Central ASBAC, Central High School ASBAC, follow, excuse me, Web First, so CEA and their representatives from Talmadge to, to present first, then the Central High School ASBAC followed by Central High School Power Peers. So that's the adjustment that we will do there. Okay. So at this time, I guess we're going to start with staff recognition. So um, we sort of have a surprise, and so I would ask um, if I could have come forward both Mr. Mike Kelly and Henry Bartle, who please feel free to have a seat right there in those chairs, and you can you can stand. And um, so they are here today uh, to share a story about one of our employees. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over them to start and then I'm going to add a little bit after they share uh, their information. So thank you gentlemen. Good to have you here. Thank you. September 19th, 726 in the morning. I know that exact time because uh, um, that was about the time I was calling 911. We had an incident at the air park. Uh, one of our pilots uh, crashed his plane. The plane got inverted, skidded along and ended up over in the dirt. And uh, if you can imagine that time in the morning, no one was there. I mean, it was empty. And I saw it from about 300 yards away. Henry saw it from inside a plane that you were starting up. We were getting ready to fly to Reno, and it's like, oh, this is really bad. This, I mean, this plane was inverted. Where the pilot should be was gone. I mean, it was, the, the cockpit was totally missing. We ran over there, and the plane was exceptionally heavy. And all of a sudden, this person shows up. And I'm going to have him stand up. Jared, please. <laughs> this, without this person, we would have never been able to lift this plane. Come, over. Come on up here. <laughs> get out of the airplane, get my keys out of the hangar, get the car, and beat him out there. <laughs> so, but we were there, and we tried to lift this airplane, and I go, oh, I'm going to have to get back in the car and get someone. And this man just shows up. He needed a cape and says, can I help? <laughs> and so he comes over. <clears throat> we lift up. I mean, we literally, this plane is uh, more than a 1,000 pounds. We get on the nose of it. We're able to lift the plane up. And the pilot is able to climb out from, and an 82-year-old gentleman uh, climbed out from underneath the plane. Uh, and at that point in time, there was a little bit of leaking fuel. The electrics are still on. So Henry and I are very worried about the plane. Jared takes the gentleman over, and then he's got his gloves on. He's got him down. He's doing first aid. It was amazing. And I called 911. I'm thinking, wow, they were really good. It was like I mean, less than 30 seconds. <laughs> what I didn't know is you were actually 
having breakfast in the restaurant. Uh, and, and maybe it's fair that you tell a little bit of your story because I, I don't know how you ever discovered <coughs> how you saw it. We, uh, we were actually having breakfast and you were trying to start your plane. And we, we actually thought it was kind of annoying. <laughs> Yep. And we saw you run out, and we saw the plane. Um, so I just happened to be there. I first saved my kit, so I knew I could help. And so I just followed your actions after there. He came out. It's about 400 pounds was the nose by the time he did everything. And the three of us lifted up, got the pilot out. He got the man uh, about 30, 40 feet away, and then started to do first aid. He was all gloved up. He was bleeding. Profusely, he had the, the, the gauze on his head. And I got some excellent pictures of this, by the way, which I don't know if you've seen yet. Uh, she has them. Right. So he did a spectacular job, and then it took about seven to ten minutes for the first people to come. And when the first people came, Jared disappeared. It's like, where'd he go? Where was he? He, was, he just left. And so the, the, the next day he goes, or a couple days later, he goes, Who was that guy? Who was that guy? <laughs> so he says, I went over to, to the high well, school. He, you had your shirt on. He had a central shirt on. Shirt. I'm like, okay, there's a clue. So I went over there. Do you know this man? He's wanted. I said, I don't need his name. And they sent me over here. They were wonderful. And uh, he needed, uh, definitely needs recognition for all the help because I would have had to get back in the car, run back to get someone else, come over there. Here, this guy is definitely where his head should be is definitely flat on the ground, and uh, it, it looked bad. Mm -hmm. But it was it was awesome. We couldn't have done it without him. And I really like to say thank you to Jared. Thank you for being so prepared. And really, a big round of applause. <laughs> also to support uh, two of our students was uh, Mr. Presley. So with that, Mr. Presley, uh, this says certification of recognition is hereby awarded to Jared Pressler in recognition of his extraordinary, extraordinary personal action to successfully serve and support the greater independence Monmouth community granted on this day, 8th of October, 2018 at Henry Hill Education Support Center, Independence, Oregon. Thank you for watching. Uh, good evening, my name is Braden Farmer and- I'm Kristen Taylor. And we're here to represent the web program at Talmadge Middle School. Tonight, uh, we would like to share with you some of the activities we've been involved in. Web is an eighth grade leadership program designed to help sixth graders with the transition to middle school. And our goal is to make the culture at Talmadge Middle School a place where everyone belongs. And over the summer, 68 eighth graders spent over two days in training in preparation for the sixth grade orientation. In August, we spent two days running the Cougar camp for 257 sixth graders and doing a variety of whole and small group activities. In September, each of the sixth graders were welcomed to a personalized note with their web leaders little group meeting. And we are currently meeting with our sixth graders in small groups as we get to know them better. At the end of the month, we will celebrate the first two months of middle school with a harvest festival planned and operated by all the eighth graders and web leaders. Our mission throughout the year will be to continue the small group activities, individual tutoring, and character lessons as a whole class. Thank you for your time and support for our program. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Jaden Adelot and I'm representing ASPIC. I'm the vice president this year and I'm happy to share what's been going on for us. Um, this uh, week we have a lot going on. This is our homecoming week, and so today we had our kickoff uh, assemb uh, kickoff court assembly, and uh, afterwards um, at seven o'clock tonight we have powder puff volleyball going on. Uh, Tuesday we have our 
Another evening activity, we'll be doing tie-dye at the, at the high school. Um, Wednesday, we have powder f football going on. And Thursday, we have our um, another homecoming assembly. Um, this one is more fun, and it's more of a pep assembly. And um, the evening activity is Amazing Race. And then Friday, we have some new things going on. Um, we have, since it's a no school day for um, the students, we have the Serpentine Assembly at 12 p.m. And the judging for that starts at 3.30. Um, and then the parade goes off at 3.40. And what's new this year is that we planned on doing a tailgate. So, and that will follow up the parade at 4.15. After that uh, will be the football game. Um, and then after the football game, we plan to host our homecoming dance to go till 11 o'clock. Um, following homecoming week, we have next week a blood drive on October 17th. And not too far in the future, we have the in November the senior Thanksgiving lunch on, which is um, on the 21st this year. And yeah, that's what will be happening. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ayana, and I'm a junior at Central High School, and I'm a part of the Power Peer class. Um, and I'm Kendra, and I'm also a junior, part of the Power Peers class. We are currently working on a video for the pantry, which is going to be about everything we have in the pantry and like where it is. Um, the things we have available um, in the pantry are clothing items, shoes, food, and hygiene products. We, al we are also trying to get immediate need items, which are underwear, socks, and anything else students um, are going to request. Um, we will need the community support on helping us get these items for the pantry and students who request them. Um, our pantry group is also working on writing a grant. Um, currently, we have a purpose video that is out which focuses on being stress-free throughout school and we um, use the video to show examples of ways to release stress throughout the school year. We will be attending the iLead conference on Saturday, November 3rd. I was able to attend this last year and what it looked like was we got put into groups with people we didn't know from other schools and they talked to us about how to work together and they gave us tips on how to work well with other people and we also played games that involved the whole group working together trying to solve things and like and try to like undo like our arms and like things like that. Um, um, we're also working with uh, Kim Proser from the Health Center. She came in today and gave information about continuing a youth um, advisory council to advocate for student health needs. And also, Power Peer students are working with um, Oregon School Based Health Alliance and will attend a Youth Advocacy Day at the Capitol in February. Um, also, later, we have um, the Power Peer students will be working with Polk County Mental Health to get QPR training, which is suicide prevention. And that's all we have for October so far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. So we have 11 folks that have given us cards. I want to remind everybody that your time is three minutes. And so I have this nice little thing. When you have a minute left, I'll kind of flip it up in the air so you know you've got to wrap it up. So I'm going to butcher names. Alicia. Dothit. Dothit. Hello, I am a first grade teacher at Monmouth Elementary School and this is my second year in the district and my second year teaching. I received this letter from a random community member who saw my still teaching no contract sign in my car and then in the window of my house and I just wanted to read it to you. To the teacher who lives at this house, I was passing by today and I saw the sign in your window. It said no contract still teaching. I don't have children, but I know that teaching is a rewarding yet difficult job. You are trying to shape young minds so they have a future that is worthy of them. I know that most teachers' work goes way beyond the hours they are paid for, grading papers, preparing lessons, and helping kids so they don't fall behind. Many teachers spend their own money on projects and supplies because some parents can't afford it or won't bring them. 
I know that many teachers work in dangerous areas, and when tragedy strikes, teachers often have to give their lives to save children and are the first people that they feel close to. I know that teachers work with children who have behavioral problems, learning disabilities, ADHD, autism, and sadly, children who sometimes are victims of abuse. I know that some parents think of teachers as glorified babysitters and don't treat them with the respect they deserve. I know that many teachers work in crumbling, overcrowded classrooms, using out-of-date books, and are often dealing with children who don't want to learn. So I want to say thank you. Thank you for choosing to be a teacher. Thank you for putting kids first. Thank you for continuing to teach even when you are not given a contract. You have earned one, you deserve one, and I very much hope you get one. I can write this because of a teacher with deep respect and appreciation. Um, so I know receiving this was like, oh my gosh, okay, so we're being heard and um, people are out there supporting us and I just thought it was a beautiful recognition and a good summary of what we're doing and the time and effort we're putting in even though we don't have contracts, even though um, these are conditions that sometimes we see, we love our jobs and we want to continue to do our jobs in a district that we're feeling safe in and supported in and I know that is everybody's goal, um, but I just thought she beautifully summarized our goal and why it's important that we do get a fair contract and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So Chris Jordan, you're up next. Hello, I'm a uh, social sciences and health teacher at the high school. I'm here tonight because I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed with the district appearing to not value teachers and staff. Teachers and staff who are employees and members of the community who have the biggest impact on our young people. I'm disappointed at the district for turning away from an opportunity to show our teachers, our parents, and especially our students that what you care about is them and their future and the futures of this community. I'm disappointed that the district continues their tradition of not coming to the table with a fair contract offer immediately, and in fact is not even moving that direction at this late of a date. I'm also angry. I'm angry with the disrespect the district is showing for me and my fellow educators by giving us increasing amounts of responsibilities and decreasing amounts of compensation. I'm angry that I'm again having to fight against my own district, who I feel should be in the business of supporting teaching and education for a fair contract. And finally, I'm worried. I'm worried that I'm going to have to take a third job, as I already have a second job, to be able to afford to teach here in Monmouth. If I do, I won't be able to spend my August lesson planning and preparing for the school year, because I will be having to be at a second job to make enough money to teach here. I won't be able to spend my time after school working with students and showing them how to do things, because I will be spending my evenings and weekend hours, as some have done in Oklahoma and other states, and go immediately from teaching to another job. I worry that I or some of my other extremely talented coworkers will be unable to provide the wonderful experiences to our young people because they have to go to other jobs, or even worse, to leave teaching altogether to be able to survive. I worry most about the young people in this community who will be losing competent and caring individuals who can't afford to stay. Or maybe even worse, have those teachers here but unable to be there after contracted hours because they have to go somewhere else. Lastly, I worry for the damage this is doing to the relationship between the district and the teachers. This relationship is in a fragile state based on previous leadership actions, but the distrust, fear, frustration, and anger are about to return even greater than before without the district being able to present a fair contract to us. <sighs> There's been a lot of talk about the culture of trust and relationship being built in the district, and we're in danger of failing that without a fair contract being offered. Please offer us a fair contract. Thank you. Aaron Marr. Good evening. I'm a parent of a student at MES and at Talmadge. On Friday when I arrived at MES to drop my daughter off, we saw the friendly faces of teachers who were standing out in the rain holding signs that read, no contract, still teaching. I had two reactions. First, I was not surprised that the teachers of our district were still teaching, even without a contract, because their dedication is well known to me. Second, I was saddened to know that they were in this difficult circumstance, that they were proceeding to do their jobs without the security of a fair contract that would guarantee them the pay and benefits they deserve. I explained what the signs meant to my daughter and wondered aloud how we could support them. This is what brings me here tonight. On behalf of my family, I want to tell all of the teachers of Central School District that we support you. We see your commitment and have been touched by the creativity and enthusiasm you bring to your work. 
We see how you make personal connections with your students, and we see the impact that those connections have on their lives. We see you work wonders under difficult circumstances, including the increasing pressure of mandated testing, the challenge of large class sizes, and the lack of funding for adequate instructional support. We cannot thank you enough for the role you play in our lives and in the life of our community. Surely the district can raise the teacher's salary so that at a minimum, salaries keep pace with inflation and provide a living wage. Our teachers deserve fair pay. Our kids need to see that we value their education and our thanks is not enough. Thank you. Mr. Gorman. Hi there, members of the school board. I'm Benjamin Gorman. I'm a teacher, I'm a proud union member, I'm a parent of a student in the school district, and I'm one of your constituents. Here we are again. Uh, you're gonna hear from a lot of angry people tonight, but I'm gonna smile because this is the mask that I wear. My 9th and 11th and 12th graders only get one shot at 9th and 10th and 11th and 12th grade, and they deserve a teacher who makes them feel welcome. They deserve a teacher who seems like he works for a district that wants him to be entirely focused on their educations. So I wear that mask for you, despite my anger and frustration. This is what it looks like. So instead of talking about that anger, I'm going to talk about the structure of your board meetings. And I've spoken with some of you individually about this. If you wanted to design a meeting to make frustrated people feel more frustrated, you couldn't come up with a more perfectly frustrating meeting. You ask people to speak with you, then you don't respond. Uh, you go about your predetermined business, and then you get frustrated when they don't wait to hear your final statements. But why should anyone stay? We know what you'll say. You'll tell us that you share our frustration, and you value the work that we do. You wear your masks too. I'm not saying you're lying. You do value our work in the same way I genuinely am glad my students arrive to my class each day. But in the same way I hide my anger, you hide that you're not willing to end the situation. Your employees keep making the same offer, pay cuts. It literally shows the district thinks we are worth less to you than last year. Valued, but worth less. And you could change that immediately. In the same way you've designed these meetings to diminish your own discomfort, you could tell your employees you don't want another uncomfortable meeting like this next month. So you'll get this contract done before the next meeting, or you will have four or five letters of resignation on the table in front of you. And they would make a fair offer, and it would be done and it, one that, it would be one that doesn't try to shift the district's insurance costs onto the backs of bus drivers and teachers and counselors and custodians and cafeteria workers and school secretaries. It would be done. But you won't do that. We choose the masks we wear. I can't make you change this meeting structure or demand a resolution to this contract situation. But I can ask for something so specific that you have to show that you're hearing us. This district rents out space to not-for-profit groups here in this very building. If things keep going the way that they're going, the CEA and the OSEA will need a joint strike headquarters. So I'm asking you for a quote. Please discuss this in your executive session and email me an amount so we can make our plans for the future. You know my email. I look forward to your reply. Thank you for at least hearing me. Thank you, Bill. Ms. Cheryl Najir. Hello, everyone. I'm Cheryl Najjar. <laughs> I'm a professional educator at MES. I was asked to speak on behalf of my fellow professional educators. So let me be clear. We appreciate the fresh new approach of our current administration. We see hard work, visibility in the schools, and involvement in our community. We respect and admire that. We see solid efforts being made to coordinate and update curriculum. We appreciate those efforts. We're grateful for the current focus on working smarter. You are providing us with valuable tools, resources, and meaningful professional development that will go a long way to foster student success. Let me also help you understand what educators are thinking and feeling as negotiations drag on. A sense of betrayal and growing distrust. 
We thought you had said that we're in this together. Now we're beginning to feel that you are not willing to support the very people you entrust with the safety and development of this community's children. For some of us, these stalled negotiations hearken back to past administrations that treated us like minions and tried to undermine our resolve. We stayed strong then, we'll stay strong now. Many of us are disheartened by the growing divide being created. We know the union's goal is to see that members are being treated fairly and to maintain the buying power of our salaries as the cost of living increases. We wonder what the district's goal is. I feel certain that district administrators want to stop this wound from festering any further. So let me be clear. Politicians can shake hands and be visible. True leaders can be trusted to compromise in order to bring people together. We invite you to show this community that you do honor the professionals who work so hard to ensure the success and well-being of our students. Show everyone, including future teachers, that this gem of a district does take care of its people in the trenches. Thank you. Lorraine Brooks. My name is Lorian Brooks and I'm a teacher at Central High School. I teach in the science department. And I'm gonna get a little bit personal here. A lot of people have been talking about their frustration and I certainly share it. Um, but I wanna tell you a little bit about my family. I have a family of four, uh, myself, my husband, and our two sons. Um, my oldest son is in seventh grade, uh, my youngest son's in third grade, and my oldest son, when he was two, stopped talking. We had no idea what was wrong. Uh, many, many doctors later, including a pediatric neurologist, several MRIs, and more tests than I can think of, uh, we learned he was healthy. He didn't have any brain damage, um, but he was on the autistic spectrum. He also had ADHD. Uh, we later learned, luckily, he was gifted. Uh, but he didn't start talking again until he was between ages three and four. Um, he sees a doctor at least every three months, has been on a daily medication since age five. Our youngest is in third grade. Um, he talked, but you couldn't understand a word he said. So from age two through today, He's been in speech therapy, which um, we also figured out about around first grade. He has ADHD, so he's been seeing doctors on a regular basis, also has been on a daily medication since age six. I myself was first diagnosed with migraines in the fifth grade. I have Hashimoto's, ADHD, other medical conditions. I could go on, but I think you get the point. My family will never be on a high deductible plan. So when I came to Central in 2015, from a district that to cover my family would have cost $920 in Florida. I couldn't afford to have my husband on our plan. It was $120 to cover a month to cover just me and my children. When I came to Central in 2015, my benefits were fully funded. Zero dollars and zero cents a month to cover my entire family. That was very, very important to me. The following year, the plan I was on changed to $66.74 a month. So I went from having a fully covered medical benefit as part of my um, paycheck, part of my salary, to paying $880.88 that year. The following year, it almost doubled, $130.06 a month, so I paid out $1,560.72. This year, at the rate that it's going, at $232.60 per month, I will lose out of my paycheck $2,791.20 in just three years. My family will never be able to afford a high deductible plan that has been, been being pushed on us. So I ask that you please consider that. Thank you. Carrie Meyer. Hello. I was born and raised in this district. And for me, education has always been a privilege. Doctors said I would never be able to attend school. 
and I've spent most of the years of my life proving them wrong. We've had excellent teachers in Central School District. I've seen this in the teachers my sisters had. I've seen them in the teachers I had, and also in the teachers that my children have had. I'm also blessed to work with fantastic individuals who inspire me to be a better teacher. We also have outstanding administrators, and I have personally witnessed positive changes in our community simply due to leadership in our district. I'm proud to be somebody who works in Central School District. Yes, we've had challenges, but we continually come through stronger and better than before. Our best work has always been done when we were all working together. Um, when our whole hearts are invested in our students and in our classrooms, we can do the job that we came to education to do. However, when we are divided, we all suffer. And it's really hard for adults, but the ones that really suffer are our students, and they're why we're all here. My request is timeliness. I want a fair contract. I want both sides to be thorough and confident with their offerings, but time is of the essence. The longer we negotiate, the longer our students' education suffers. We need to settle a contract so that we can all get back to the job of doing what we want to do, helping our students wholeheartedly. Whatever you can offer to facilitate this process, that's what I'm asking. So please help us to come to an agreement that will allow our district to break beyond this barrier and to continue to thrive. Thank you. Marie Lejeune. I'm Marie Lejeune, and I'm the parent of four children here in Central Schools. Um, and I'm here today to urge the board to settle the current contract and provide a fair raise to central teachers and classified staff. Um, some of you know that my professional life also intersects significantly with Central School District as I'm a professor in the College of Education at Western Oregon University, and I have been for the past decade. Um, when I came to interview for a position as a professor of literacy education at WU in 2007, I was a little bit on the fence. I didn't know if I wanted to live in a small town, and I knew that living here would be very different from our past experiences of living in urban centers outside of Portland and Las Vegas. Two things convinced me to take the job at Western and to make Monmouth home. When my hiring committee learned that I did most of my research in classrooms on literacy instruction, they arranged my schedule for the day and took me to elementary schools here that I needed to see. I was so impressed by the quality, authentic literacy instruction I saw going on there that I knew I wanted to work in a, in a university and a community like this. I wanted to work with teachers who were so dedicated to equity and inclusion and quality teaching. Secondly, Mark Gerard, who was on my hiring committee at the time and is now the dean, promised me in my interview that Monmouth and Central School District would be an amazing place to raise my family. And he's been more than right. As someone who prepares teachers, I believe fiercely in the profession of education. I continue to be impressed and awed by the dedication of Central School District teachers and staff and the community they build for our children. My children have learned to be readers and writers and mathematicians, to love history and science and music and art, but they've also learned how to be critical thinkers and kind-hearted citizens from the models they see in their teachers here. They know their teachers care for them and love them because they see it in the actions of their teachers who spend countless hours beyond their contracts, volunteering, attending their games and events, staying late to grade their papers and to plan amazing lessons for them. And when I drive through town on any given Sunday, the school district, uh, the school parking lots are full of teachers and I know there are teachers who will leave this meeting tonight and go back to their classrooms so that they can be ready for the students. When I started writing the notes to come here and speak tonight, to be honest, I was moved to tears. I often say to my own students who are preparing to become teachers that teachers are children's first responders, and teachers in the school district have been my children's first responders. People who know my family know that we went through a long period with a lot of personal grief. When my husband was diagnosed with cancer and ended up in the ICU, teachers in this district bought dinners to our family, sent notes home, called, texted, emailed me to make sure that they were okay and to let me know how days had been when I was at the hospital. When my father died and my children were struggling with grief, teachers made sure that my kids had a safe place to go and I knew they'd be okay. 
When my high school son was injured days before his first set of final exams at the high school, every one of his teachers immediately emailed me to plan accommodations to help him be successful. I could go on and on about the ways that teachers here in Central not only taught my children, but cared for my children as people and modeled compassion for my entire family. Most of you know that Oregon is facing a critical teaching shortage. As someone who prepares teachers, I know this very well. When bright young people consider the professions they will choose, it is hard to sell education and teaching when they know they will be underpaid and will often feel undervalued by society. We have a chance to show our community that we value our teachers and classified staff. This past year, many of the teacher candidates at Western had multiple job offers. The bilingual teachers who graduated this year had competing offers from many districts and were fielding multiple phone calls from principals and other administrators. Luckily, young teachers are becoming savvier and are reading contracts. They notice what districts pay, what benefits cost in each district, and what professional development money is offered to support teachers' careers. For many years, Central School District has lagged behind in these areas. Selfishly, I want the best teacher candidates not only placed in Central Schools, and I do my part for that, but I want to see them hired here. And I think we do that because dozens of teachers here I've had the pleasure of teaching and working with. However, I worry that we will lose some of these amazing teachers. They will not apply in Central. We will not attract them to our community. I worry more that we'll lose some of the amazing teachers we already have. I know that many teachers in Central Schools stay here because they see our community as supportive and like a family. Let's show them that this is true. Let's take care of teachers and staff. Let's make sure that their families are taken care of and that they're not taking pay cuts. I urge you as a parent and an educator to invest in our community. And I want to say thank you so much to the teachers here who've made a difference in my children's lives. Thank you. So Lori Zamansky. I'm Lori Schmansky, and I am a teacher at uh, Central High School Language Arts and Yearbook, and I have been teaching there for 20 years. Um, and like many of the teachers who have spoken before, I'm frustrated. I'm feeling extremely frustrated that we are here again, and it has been way too many times. Um, but because I am a teacher, I'm going to illustrate to you um, why it's damaging and part of where, just a little piece of where that frustration comes from. So I have a visual aid. I've been teaching for 20 years and each year I average about 175 students um, in my classes. So if I take that 20 and multiply it by 175, I have 3,500 students that I have taught in my career. The number is probably a little higher than that, but that is the way averages work. Um, the next number is a little tricky. Uh, my English department and I tried to confer and figure out exactly how much time do we spend grading papers. And that's a number we don't like to talk about because it's a little scary and a little intimidating. Um, I average 10 to 15 minutes per essay per kid. Um, if it's AP, it's about half an hour, which means one class set of essays takes me a good eight hours. Um, so we talked and we conferred and I came up with a number of two hours per student per year, which is probably a pretty low ball number, but I feel that um, it covers kind of the high end and the low end and in my teaching career I've taught just about everything, so two hours. If you multiply two hours by 3,500 students, you get a total number of 7,000 hours grading. And uh, that number seems a little abstract, so what I did was I took it out of work days. So divide that by eight hours in a day, and you get 875 days. And our teaching contract is 190 days, right? So if you take that number, 875, and divide it by 190, which represents a contract year, the number is 4.6 years. 4.6 years. And the thing is about that is I don't grade at school. I grade before school. I grade after school, late into the evenings, weekends, and vacations. So that's basically 4.6 years that I personally have given the district for free. And my colleagues standing behind me, I know many of them have done more than that. Um, 
I also know, and they will all agree with me, that on any given week we spend much more time planning than we do grading. So you can take this number and you can multiply it at least by two, and now the number is 9.2 years in my 20 years that I have given the district for free. So I get the teacher sacrifice, but this seems extreme. And the thing I think that infuriates me the most is that I can give this kind of sacrifice, just me, not counting all these people standing behind me, and somehow the district bargaining committee is offering a payment that says, my reward for this sacrifice is getting paid less this year than last year. So I urge you, this is creating so much damage and frustration and it smacks of so much of the old and the same that we have been through before and I want to believe that it's going to get better and I know this is not the message that you want to send to us. I know that you want to send a message that we are valued. So please urge your bargaining committee to come back to us with a fair package and a fair wage because you do not want to reward your veteran teachers like this. You have probationary teachers here and what Marie Lejeune said, new teachers aren't going to want to come here if this is how veteran teachers are rewarded. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly. Segra. So before I officially start, I wanted to share um, all the things I represent here because my position is kind of unique. First and foremost, I'm a parent. I'm a mother of three kids, two of which are in the district. I have a fourth grader and a first grader at Ash Creek. Um, I wrote it down so I make sure I said it all. I'm currently a sub at the elementary level, so I'm working at MES, IES, and Ash Creek um, for both licensed teachers and instructional assistants, so I'm subbing for both those positions, so I'm seeing a little bit of everything. Um, I worked full-time last year as a special ed assistant at Ash Creek Elementary, um, and my children, my daughter also attended IES uh, a couple years ago, um, and my husband was K through 12, central grad, all the way up, so he's a product of Central School District, now with a master's and works at Oregon State University. And um, I graduated from Western Oregon as a licensed teacher in 2006 with a degree in early childhood education focusing in math and Spanish um, and with my ESOL bilingual endorsement. I left the profession in 2009 to be at home with my kids. So that's the perspective I'm offering. Since I, so last year was my first year back in the schools as a staff member. Um, and the responsibilities of a teacher have increased in that time period and that's just, that's just what's expected with academics. Teachers have more benchmarks and academic demands that students are expect, expected to achieve than ever. Classroom sizes are increasing. Students are coming into the school year way behind, sometimes as much as two to three grade levels or more below their class. Um, and since the, cl the class sizes are increasing, but instead of hiring more teachers, support staff and administration, the majority of the responsibility still falls on the classroom teacher and the support staff. Teachers are expected to differentiate for all the different learning levels, adapt for speakers of other language, tag students, special ed students to be behavior specialists and trauma counselors. I keep getting asked why as a licensed teacher I haven't reapplied to teach here in Central School District and it's simple. I'm not ready to do that to myself and my family, but they are, all of them. And they do it every single day and I said I wouldn't get emotional, I'm already starting. What am I not ready for? One of the biggest challenges I've seen in every school I work in this district for is behavior. Extreme behaviors are happening all over the district and teachers have very little resources to support these high need students. I regularly witness and experience behaviors such as students causing phys physical harm to classmates, teachers and support staff, students running out of their classrooms, screaming profanities in the halls and at their teachers, tearing things off the walls, throwing school supplies, chairs, and teachers having to vacate their entire classroom of students to keep them safe. Teachers are expected to help these individual students while also with their challenges while also helping an entire classroom of kids be successful with academics and behaviors as well. Despite this, these teachers show up day after day. They work themselves to the bone. I've seen their sweat and tears, so, so many tears. I've watched some of them leave the profession forever, and many of them are regularly considering leaving it despite their passion for their students and their teaching. Unless you are at the schools day after day, you have no idea what they do and what they go through. They work hours and hours beyond their contract, 
which now has to be cut for so many of them also because they're not even allowed to have their own children at school with them anymore so they can't have that extra time to plan. Teachers, I want you to hear that you are valued, you're important, you are appreciated, and that so many of us see you and the work you are doing. You matter so, so much to so many, and I'm privileged to call so many of you coworkers, colleagues, but most importantly, my friends. Please don't let anyone tell you that you don't value your students or that you care more about money than teaching. Your demands are completely reasonable, and anyone that's been present in the schools would never think otherwise. I could go on and on about what we actually need is smaller class sizes, more staff, counselors, behavior specialists, classrooms for students to help learn how to control behavior, assistance for every classroom and more, and I won't even mention the salary that I actually believe teachers should be paid each year. But that's not the focus tonight. Instead, I'm going to ask you to think about what message we're sending to our community, our students, and the families in our district about what value we place on teachers. Our teachers aren't even asking for a giant pay increase, which they do deserve. They're simply asking to have their pay be adjusted to accommodate the changes for the increased cost of living, money that already exists in the district budget, so that our teachers won't be taking a pay cut with the increase in insurance costs and in the cost of living for this year. At the very least, we can show our teachers we value them enough to meet this reasonable request. Thank you. Claudette Garcia. I'm Claudette Garcia, and um, until a week before school this year, I would have been starting my 24th year in kindergarten. I had Steve's kids. Um, I've been dedicated to this district. I've been working here for 25 years. And so, um, a week before, before school, I was told that I would be moving to third grade. Rather than grieve it, I chose to embrace it. And what that meant was I had to transform my classroom from a kindergarten room to third grade. Now, with $100 that the district provides, that wasn't enough money to do that. So, since the beginning of school year, I have spent, out of my own pocket, $2,436.80. I've done that because I'm committed to my students. I love my students. I love their families. I want my students to have the best opportunities to be prepared for life. And so, I've also gifted 62 hours since the beginning of September of my own time. I'm not unusual. This isn't unusual. There are people behind me that have given their own money, given plenty of their own time. And so that's how teachers commit themselves to their students and community. And I ask, how does the district commit itself to their teachers? For a teacher who's been devoted to this district for 25 years, you would be asking me to take a pay cut. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's fair. And so I urge you to reconsider. Thank you. I'm gonna read a statement here and then we're gonna take a little break. As the board president, I wanna thank all of you for your presence today at the board meeting. Your voices are important to us as we continue to move the district forward focused on the central school district goals of student growth and achievement, family engagement, community partnership, staff leadership, and continuous improvement. Based on initial interviews when the district entered into the conversance process, staff shared that transparency was important, especially on big decisions with the leadership of con Dr. Cabista and her belief in this approach, we've been upfront and transparent from the beginning of our negotiations, including sharing our financial officer, our financial offer early in the process. The district also under her leadership decided to remove the district's legal counsel from the negotiation table to have a more open and honest communication and conversation about the contract, which I feel is a part of the bargaining team we have. 
The board and district under the direction of Dr. Cabista feel it is important to look at the big picture of where we need to go as a district, which you all have so eloquently develop, deployed, developed by our district strategic goals. We will continue to listen, work on our relationships, and develop a positive work environment to support students, staff, and the great communities we serve. We hear your concerns. We appreciate and value both our classified and our licensed staff and work that they are doing as we continue to work towards settlements and our collective bargaining agreements that are fair, equitable, and sustainable. And sustainable is the important piece. So at that, we're gonna take a five minute break. So if you guys don't wanna stay for the rest of the board meeting, you can go ahead and leave. And at that, I call a five minute break. So Denise, you're up, you're on stage. I uh, just want to share a couple of things with you. Um, our classified employees represent 1,748 years, or four, yeah, 1,748 years, okay. six months, and 19 days of service to this district, with the average employee having worked over 9.55 years. We take to heart the level of responsibility we carry in being a positive role model for our students. We cherish every moment, even in the toughest days, because we see up close the need our students have for caring, concerned adults in their lives. We fully grasp that the level of need is different for each student and that we may be the only beacon of light for some. It's a heavy burden that we all carry gladly and we work hard each day to recognize and meet those needs. We are fully dedicated to working for students, but we also need to watch out for each other and our own families. And sometimes it's harder to ask for our own needs to be met. But I'm asking you now to please give my fellow caring classified employees a fair and meaningful contract that allows them to feel protected and cared for so they in turn can meet the needs of their own families. Thank you. So Cease, we're down to you. And mine is extraordinarily brief. Um, in your packet was our financial report as of August 31st. And that is a um, <coughs> report that prior to when we upload new contracts. So that was last year's payroll dollars reflected there as well as purchases that were made through August 31st and encumbrances or purchase orders, commitments that we had made up to that time. So nothing to um, bring to your attention for the August 31st financial report. And that was all I had for you. And nothing on the maintenance and capital? Nothing. Okay. No. Okay, so we're down to the superintendent's report. And uh, bear with me, uh, we are in the midst uh, with the board and I know uh, Director Mann and I know Director Klein have been a part of this, but we are in the midst of uh, really going through our policies. And so uh, this is first reading and I have 15 policies. So I'm going to generally share uh, information about each policy and what it is uh, so the the community is aware so the first um, the first policy that we're looking at is CPA which is uh, called layoff recall administrative personnel and this policy applies to any and all licensed administrators uh, below the rank of assistant superintendent and uh, really looks at should we have to uh, lay off or recall any of their uh, placements. Um, again, this is a policy that is, is necessary to put into place. Um, I know that I will continue to work with the representatives of the administrative team and we will develop processes, processes should this um, approach ever have to uh, come to fruition. So that's the first one on its first reading and that's CPA. The next one, ECACB, uh, this is a federal and state required uh, statute. Uh, it deals with unmanned aircraft systems, AKA drones. We are required by law to have a policy that should we have uh, any employees or uh, 
district programming that may have drones that we have to have this policy in place. A little bit different in our community because we have the air park. There's actually more or higher restrictions for us. We actually cannot use drones in this area, but we are required by law to have this should we have to at some point if we want to have that type of program. Uh, just I want the community to know and that is something that we're going to continue to look into if that is something that we go towards in the future, but the the uh, process and the statutes that we will have to follow because we are near an airport is uh, pretty extreme. But again, if we want to move in that direction, so that's the first reading because this is a required policy um, both at the state and federal level. Uh, the next one is EEA under the support services for student transportation services. And this really is a policy that's a description of who the district will provide transportation for. Um, it really updates the policy from No Child Left Behind to uh, recognizing the Every Student Succeeds Act, also known as ESSA, and I'm going to refer to ESSA multiple times uh, within the policies. Um, what's unique about this change to this policy is there is some new language that supports students who may be victims of violent crimes. And so there's some updating that we need to move forward with. There's also additional uh, language regarding the notification and information of transportation officials for students who have medical or behavioral protocols. And I know that both um, our director of student services and our manager of transportation are continuing to, to develop those systems as we move forward. So that communication becomes more clear and this policy helps us move in that direction. The next policy, GBEC, and again, this is tied to personnel issues, uh, is focused on a drug-free workplace. Uh, this is a new updated version of our previous policy. And again, this policy promotes safe Safety, health, and efficiency by prohibiting unlawful manufacturing, distri distribution, dispensa dispensation, possession, or use of a controlled substance or alcohol in the workplace. So again, it is an updated policy uh, that we will be moving forward with. The next one is GBK dash. -G uh, KGC, you're going to hear the KGC later. I'm not going to repeat it twice, but it, it gives the same amount of information. The GBK stands for personnel. The KGC is more community-based. So again, we, when we do policies at times, there are multiple policies that not only uh, are tied to personnel, but also when we do have community on our sites. Um, this is in regards to the use and distribution and sale of tobacco products or inhalants. Uh, delivery systems by staff and others prohibiting uh, that on district premises and facilities. Um, and so again, this is just an updated version of this language. Uh, there is more uh, information in there uh, if you want to look at that. But uh, again, this is an updated and you're going to see that also at the end in the K, excuse me, in the KCGC one as well. The next one, GD, is a personnel, uh, and this is very important to me. This is called classified staff and classified staff positions. This is uh, really recognition that we have, and they are important in the work that we do, classified staff. And so this policy uh, just articulates that they do not have to hold a, a license, that, that myself or designees can uh, designate classified employees uh, within their positions. Obviously, we're going to follow uh, within the agreements that we have with the uh, OSEA Association, but really working to show what those uh, essential job functions are, titles, what that work would be performed. So uh, this is a new policy and very important that we move forward uh, in having that within our policy manual. The next one, GDA, is also a personnel tied to instructional assistance. And this is really a policy of what that looks like and how you become an instructional assistant in that process. You're going to see some small edits to that policy change uh, that really is referencing that the hiring is done at the building level and or through human resources. Um, and there's also a slight change in language. Title I is now called Title A, and so there's a, a shift in language there as well. The next one, GDI, again, is tied to personnel, and it is talking about class, excuse me, classified staff assignments and transfers, uh, and it really is talking about uh, that we would work uh, in, a, in accordance with the district needs and that we have the ability to uh, assign and transfer classified staff. However, I also say that when we do that, that we do that within amongst the agreements that we have with OSEA. So again, it's a policy set forth that we don't have that, but uh, we need to have that within our, 
our guidelines. <laughs> the next one uh, is related to instruction, IBDJA. It's relations with homeschooled students. Uh, there is a, a shift uh, in this in the fact that we want to recognize the rights of parents uh, to educate their students at home, which they have that right to do, and acknowledge that the educational services and the district's role is in registering and monitoring results of those uh, homeschool students. What's important about this is it gives us language and clarity uh, for what the district will and will not do or provide for students that are homeschooled. Um, and again, it's, it, it goes into detail specifically tied to interscholastic activities as well as uh, activities in the school such as physical education, uh, music, et cetera, because those, those are uh, open and offered to homeschool students uh, within a public setting. So again, that's, that's clarity in, in how we work through uh, in supporting our homeschool students. The next one, IGDJ, again, tied to instruction. And this is one of uh, the important things that I think is, is lost at times, and that is the uh, activities. And this is specifically interscholastic activities and how they are a huge impact in the success of a student's education. Uh, so this is a policy that provides us a frame for interscholastic activities within our school district. Uh, we know that this is an integral role in character development, enhancement of the educational opportunities for students. Uh, this policy talks about language addressing compliance with Title IX, as well as the conduct of athletes themselves in a manner that is consistent with the letter and spirit of policies, rules and regulations of the district, as well as the Oregon School Activities Association, uh, and really specifically focusing on the sportsmanship approach uh, to that. Uh, I, I want to commend, because last meeting our power peers did share, uh, as well as in my conversation with Mr. O'Malley, who is our uh, high school athletic director, that they are already working through some of these procedures. They are in the midst of a Title IX audit, and I am thankful for them as they, they continue through that. So again, this is just to recognize in policy how important that is to us in the school district. The next one is a deletion. It is IIAC. Again, it's tied under instruction. It is tied to library materials and selection. And before anybody has any panic, um, we are deleting this policy because the library materials uh, selection process is actually in policy IIA. And so, uh, which is the instructional resource and instructional materials. And I'm gonna tell you publicly, and it's in paragraph five. So people, when they go and look, it's the fifth paragraph uh, addressing all, supplement, all supplementary materials, including library and media resources. So again, it's a really, we have a double policy that we can eliminate the IIAC. The next one, uh, I'm very excited. This is a new policy, JAHHB-students. Uh, this is trauma-informed schools. And so I'm actually gonna take a moment. This is, I think, very important to us as we continue to move forward. Um, because again, we know how much the impact on childhood that trauma can have uh, leads to their, their risk for academic failures, uh, severe attendance issues, severe school behavior concerns, et cetera. And I, I am actually gonna call out, uh, if, if you are in the room and feel comfortable, and if you don't feel comfortable, I am okay with that because again, I do not want to cause trauma on you as well. But if I do have members uh, that are a part of uh, Central High School that are part of the trauma-informed cohort, if you feel comfortable standing, I would just like to recognize you for the work that you continue to do uh, within, that, within the building and that you continue to lead as we uh, move forward with it. Uh, my goal is uh, through a K-12 approach and one of those first steps. So thank you three ladies for standing. I appreciate your work as you continue to do this at the high school. So this this policy reads as followed. The trauma-informed approach to education is intended to improve attendance, graduation rates, and reduce incidents of behavior that can inhibit learning. The district recognizes that the developmental impact of childhood and historic trauma increases student risk for, but not limited to, the ac to academic failure, severe attendance problems, severe school behavior concerns, and possible chronic health concerns, which neg negatively impact student engagement and learning. 
The district is committed to providing trauma-informed schools and culturally responsive programs where all students feel included, welcome, valued and supported, which I must also say is in one of multiple of our strategic goals that we have developed together. And we're addressing trauma, trauma's impact on learning school-wide is integral to the district's educational mission. The district will strive to create physical and emotional, emotionally safe and culturally responsive environments where all staff, students, families, through effective professional development in school procedures and school practices and instruction in the following areas. Understanding the widespread impact of trauma and the role of schools in promoting resiliency. Recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma in students, families, and staff and integrating knowledge about trauma and social emotional learning in children. The superintendent or designee is directed to implement a trauma-informed approach, which we are working on, uh, to educate through the application of culturally responsive trauma-informed practices in the district schools and programs. So again, thank you for allowing me to share that because I think this is a, a huge step for us uh, as a district. Uh, the next one, KAB, is really tied to, is tied to community relations, and it's really focused on parent legal guardian rights. This is an updated version to the current policy, and again, referencing the Every Student Success Act, ESSA language, and it really is the definitions and procedures that will be used to implement uh, parental requirements as it relates to the ESSA language. Uh, and then. We also have in the packet the K-A-B-A-R that goes with that. Um, and so, and then the last one is just, as I said, it's the community version of the prohi prohibited use, distribution, and sale of tobacco products and inhalants delivery system. So, whew, with that overview, I'm going to just, to the Board of Directors, are there questions or concerns that you have in any of the, the policies? I have a suggestion that would be... I like the summary of the trauma, the trauma informed. That particular policy feels different to me. It feels really significant. Um, I think it would be maybe next month we mm -hmm. could do a kind of a deep dive review of where we've come from with our trauma informed grant and kind of translate that policy into what it looks like for us specifically. So we understand as a board and as a district really what we're signing up for. I mean, all, all the language, I mean, everything makes sense. It's like, okay, we gotta be prepared to actually mm -hmm. do that. Yep. So. Okay. I don't, I don't know that we've had a review of the trauma-informed initiative since we started it. Um, so it just seems like it'd be a good time to do that con to coincide with mm -hmm. the policy adoption. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Just a quick procedural question. Or do we actually approve ARs? No, I just put that so in there as, it's, yes, correct. It's, it's information only. There are going to be times that, that are, if there are ARs tied to it, I will want you to see them. And again, you, you, we do not have to vote on those, but it'll always come in first reading because I think it's important for okay. you to see the, um, really the step-by-steps -step that, that we yeah. do with the administrative teams to uh, really implement the policy. Got it. That for later. I'm just doing a clear, I'm just doing a check, Miss, uh, I wanted to make sure that the Talmadge students were your presentation. We're just confirming. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, board report. Upcoming activities, we got a PLC meeting on the 22nd at six o'clock. Don't forget we have the regional dinner meeting on the 23rd over at Marion County, or Marion, the... ESD? West, Willamette ESD. ESD, anyway. And uh, you're supposed to RSVP with her, Adriana. We'll meet at 5.30 here if you're gonna take off from here. Our next board meeting is on November 5th at 6.30. Don't forget that we have the OSBA conference in Portland on the 9th through the 11th. And we have a board planning retreat, remember to mark your calendars, it is November 30th and December 1st. Is or we can choose to look you? at potentially one of those days. I know we had narrowed that down, so we can have that conversation as well of which day is better. Uh, we have our planning retreats have usually been is that i think that's a saturday 
Saturday, yeah. From nine Saturday, to nine. nine to one. Yeah, probably about a, a morning or to midday but I don't retreat. Know the 30th. And I believe we may have scheduled on the just the first so we can move in that direction. Yeah, I think we have a placeholder on the first, and yeah. then we should just confirm if that's what we still want to do. Saturday looks good to me. Yeah. Okay, wife's, we're moving it's to my the wife's birthday, but I'll come. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So make sure we so keep we're gonna, it short. We will make that change for the retreat just on the first. Thank you. So we're down to the consent agenda. So do I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda? Also move. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion pass unanimously. And that gets us down to the business agenda, and you are going to talk yes. about the... Conference. So I am bringing forth uh, to you, because the board is responsible for the approval of the district calendar, um, as it relates to the number of days associated with the licensed staff. Uh, the agreement that we are working from currently establishes a total of 191 contract days. In the spirit of the calendar, or in the spring, the calendar committee, district staff, and the associations reviewed the calendar for the 2018-19 school year. As we've added the dates into the district systems, it came, uh, I became aware that we have a total of 192 days in the calendar. And therefore, it's necessary for us to shift one day as an unpaid day, uh, which we have established as October 12th. Uh, I want to also be clear that uh, the district budgeted several days of additional professional development outside of the contracted days as staff shared. This was an important step for us to take uh, moving forward across the district, which really can be reflected in two of our strategic goals that we talk about, student growth and achievement and staff leadership and continuous improvement that we talk about professional development. So with that shift, the licensed staff still receive their 191 days and the opportunity to earn additional uh, dollars by attending professional development on the 12th. And again, we have multiple days that we have uh, set aside from a district perspective for additional professional development. So I'm requesting an approval to amend the contract as presented. Um, which, and again, we will, the, the count, excuse me, the calendar, <laughs> the calendar, <laughs> you can clearly tell what's on my mind, you can clearly tell what's on my mind. If we can uh, move forward with the calendar, uh, and then this spring we will again work with the calendar committee to establish and look at to make sure that we don't have this uh, mistake better. again. Can I ask a question? Or? Yeah. So I'm looking at the calendar though in our in our notes or in package. So we have other unpaid days. Is that right? Like the 31st of August was an unpaid day. Right? Correct. Uh, so that uh, there was some language that some staff flexed because there are four work days in the year. So there was a agreement that we have uh, in tentative agreement with the union that we allowed some staff to work if they didn't want to work at the end of the school year. So some staff worked and some staff chose to not have that as a paid day or as an unpaid day. So it's really, so any of the unpaid days then, so November 23rd, January 21st, those are those also unpaid days? Correct. So those are really optional days then. Do we budget for those days? We, so some of those days are true unpaid days in the calendar, but we have budgeted uh, several days outside of the, what I'm going to say, both the license and, and classified designated days to have additional PD. We have PD days built into the calendar, but we also uh, have, and what was shared with me by, by staff, in the buildings that there was wanting to have additional days, whether that be given to the principals to have the flexibility or if there's key things that we wanted to work as a district to offer conference style or um, potentially have other trainings that we would wanna offer as school gets out for additional time for staff if they wanna be a part of that, which again was one of the messages that was shared with me last year. So, so those don't count and please correct me if I'm wrong, Cease. No, it's 
it's just those those days you're looking at have traditionally been unpaid and it's it's a function of saying if we always start the Monday before Labor Day, bringing folks back for training development and work days, and we're going to always end after graduation sometime, there's set number of work days, weekly days. And because we only contract for 190 days or 187 days, there's a bunch of days in there that will be considered unpaid weekdays. And those have traditionally been the Friday before Labor Day, that Friday um, after Thanksgiving, and then um, when we <coughs> added the holidays in January, Martin Luther King Day typically uh, was considered that unpaid day off. So those have not changed. And then it's a function of how many days sort of at the end of the year after graduation that are work days, grade days, and in this case, optional professional development days. So, but because when we picked those dates this year and you counted them out, it ended up being an extra one. October 12th now, because that is statewide in-service and his sis historically been an unpaid day as well for people to choose to attend professional development. That was why it, it and, was and I think that's that selected. And I think that will be a conversation with the calendar committee of, so do we want this continuing as an unpaid day or do we want it as a paid day? And then we would adjust the calendar accordingly with the committee and make that recommendation moving forward back to you, so. Okay, so it's, if we treat it as unpaid, the staff have the option of working, either doing professional development or using it just as a day to do catch up. Or, or they choose However not they to work. Or they can choose you know, not to work. It's, it's really, really focused, and really we are being very intentional about the professional development right. that is to be used to, as a professional development day. Okay. So do we have to vote to Well, approve? again, you it is amendment to the calendar, so I, yeah. I believe it. you are yeah. responsible for that. So. Again, I would ask for a so uh, amendment I, to the current. Do I hear a motion to, to the calendar? <laughs> Revised calendar. They could. They could. I make like a motion that we approve the revised calendar as presented. Second. Moved and seconded by Peggy and Jerry. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Passes unanimously. And where do we go next? Where do we go next? Comments from the board members. Do, 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 do. Comments by the board members. I'll come back to you, you're thinking, I can tell. Jerry, you got anything for us this month? Yes. Um, article on the, the uh, itemizer about how lousy the whole state students do on the math test. Now either we got a boatload of dumb kids or I think more likely that the test is not realistic. Because if more than half, if you're a teacher and more than half of your students are flunking, um, they're probably gonna take a little look at how are you teaching? Because anyway, I, I see where McMinnville supposedly is one of the outstanding ones and they got 50%. Uh, I just wonder if maybe Jen, the next time you go to a superintendent's meeting or meet with the people over in the Capitol, I started to say something derogatory. Uh, <clears throat> that maybe you can, hey, is this realistic? Because it's, the kids aren't getting it and, and it's probably not because of the lousy teachers or dumb kids, it's probably because the test is here and the average kid is. So a couple things, Jerry, I think um, when you, I am excited and, and I shared today in our intra-district communication uh, 
some three-year trend uh, cohort data, which is looking at uh, kids overall, the same set of kids in a three-year trend, uh, similar to what I shared with you all in my, one of my Friday reports. Uh, I think we are making, and I, um, as we get the state report card, which we are still in bar mode, <coughs> so we cannot share what I know yet, um, but I am very excited at some point to be able to share with you all because there are some successes we are excited about. Well, we are moving up. We are, we are moving, we, we are, are moving up. We are moving up, but we still got, you know. Correct, and I think one of the key things, in, and I'm gonna, as I see a couple of my, uh, our, uh, uh, both middle school and uh, high school teachers here. I think when you talk about math, uh, the standards, uh, the, and I'm gonna start say a little bit about algebra. Uh, algebra starts to come into uh, math, which is a really high order of thinking, which is important for our kids to understand. You start to see the standards come in as of fifth, sixth grade. Um, and I would even say, I have a couple of my third and fourth grade teachers, there's a little bit of algebra correct in third and second grade uh, that we are beginning to see. And so there's some big jumps uh, that are tied to the standards uh, when you look at math and that's uh, the continued conversation that we wanna have with our staff and how we approach that. I think that we're, we're doing some really good things and, and we'll continue to talk through that, the, the, the state test. I know that our high school have made some huge steps uh, when you look at the 11th grade um, uh, results over three years, we are moving uh, in the right direction. So I'm very appreciative to the staff and the teachers that are that are doing that. But uh, again, I think there's multi uh, multitude of things when you when you look at uh, those standards. I hate saying this, but our our actual results are what the national results are also showing. And so that's the trend that uh, we're seeing. So I'm not going to. Maybe the test is unrealistic. I'm not going to disagree that there may be some equitable things that we need to continue to look at when it comes to the test. And I am more than willing as the superintendent, and we'll continue to share that uh, as we look at that, Jerry. So I do appreciate that. And one other thing. <laughs> I was, before this thing went south on me, I was actually using it. I was reading some of the articles. There's a district, I think, in back east where they're having drag queen presentations. I hope we never get into that here. So, anyway, it was interesting what they're trying to pull back there, but I hope we don't do that here. Other than that, I'm going to shut up. Anything, Peggy? Your turn? You're good? Let's get to executive Okay, session. Don. No? Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody that came tonight for the meeting. I want to thank everybody that stuck around. I know sometimes these things tend to drag on. Thank you for everything that you do for the district. Denise, you're getting more comfortable every time you come and speak to us. You know it. You better watch out. You never know what will happen next month. <laughs> <laughs> We are going to be going into executive session for the purpose of to conduct deliberations with persons designated to carry on labor negotiations. We do not anticipate coming out and making any decisions. With that, we're going to take a 10 minute recess and then we'll be going into executive session. And thank you again for everybody that came tonight.